Hey YouTube, it's Mr. Terry, your history teacher, here with another History Teacher Reacts video. Today, what we are doing is continuing on with the Epic History TV little mini series on World War One. So I did a reaction video to the first one, which was on 1914. I got enough response that it looked like you guys wanted to see me kind of continue it. And again, it looks like what they're doing here is basically breaking down the war, I guess, year by year. And so we're in 1915, that's the, uh, in, into the second year of the war, although the war started in the middle of 1914. So this will be the first full year of the war. And of course, people never knew how long this would last. Um, but I think 1915 is really going to show us that this thing is possibly here to stay for a while. So we're going to check this out in just a second. Now, the original video link is down below. It's important that you go um, click on that, get the views, the likes, subscribe, all that stuff over there. And I'm excited to uh, continue this a little bit more. Um, just one other thing. We still have the uh, World War II shirts in the T, uh, Teespring store. I don't know how long those are going to go on necessarily, but if you want to pick one up, go down below. The link is down there as well as some other links like Discord, Patreon, all that other stuff. Let's go ahead and get started with 1915. Let's see what we can learn. January 1915. World War One is just five months old. And already, around one million soldiers have fallen. Amazing. A war that began in the Balkans has engulfed much of the world. The Central Powers, Germany, Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire, fight the Allies. Britain, France, Russia, Serbia and Montenegro, Belgium and Japan. The unsung... <laughs> uh heroes of the war on both sides right you get more than just the big three remember the ottoman empire joined up a little bit later they weren't part of the pre-war uh, war alliance and remember italy was a part of the pre-war alliance with germany austria hungary but they basically end up flipping didn't like the terms and that kind of stuff and honestly probably got a little bit better of a deal from the allies because maybe they get to it later but um italy was kind of secretly promised territory from austria hungary some other some other land and things like that around the Adriatic. Um, but that'll become an issue later to see if those promises end up getting fulfilled. But like I said too, um, we had never seen casualties in such a short frame in this many uh, uh, shorter battles, um, or they weren't short, but you know what I mean? Like that amount of battles in six months, never seen casualties like this. So you can tell, I think pretty quickly, not necessarily how long this is gonna last, but this is a different war than anyone has ever experienced. In Poland and the Baltic, the Russian army has suffered a string of massive defeats, but continues to battle German and Austro-Hungarian forces. Austro-Hungarian troops have also suffered huge losses and are humiliated by their failure to defeat Serbia. Russia's having to fight multiple at the same time. That's in rough. the Caucasus Mountains, Russian and Ottoman forces fight each other in freezing winter conditions. Remember, that's been a rivalry between Russia and Ottoman Empire that has lasted uh, many decades, even centuries um, at this time, specifically for the two vying for area around the Black Sea, Caspian Sea. Those have rich oil regions and um, are very important to the economies, especially here in the industrialized world where things like oil are such a big commodity for industrialization. While on the Western Front, French, British and Belgian troops are dug in facing the Germans, in trenches French stretching time. from the English Channel to Switzerland. Coast of the mountains, total war. As part of the world's first strategic bombing campaign, Germany sends two giant airships known as Zeppelins to bomb Britain. They hit the ports of Kings Lynn and Great Yarmouth, damaging houses and killing four civilians. Uh, we'll see if they get into it, but I think it's important to understand the term total war, especially in the academic sense that people have talked about, because you might hear that. Um, total war kind of takes war to a different level than maybe some wars uh, are. For example, um, in a total war, a government, a nation, their resources and everything are prioritized number one towards the war, right? Um, that, that may, you know, making sure governments come in and take sometimes total control of the economy to make sure that the military is getting what they needed with resources, 
um, funds, those sort of things. Another thing that's often looked at a total war is whole nations are at war, not just militaries at war. You see the difference where potentially civilians could be seen as a target. You're fighting a nation, not just a nation's army. And unfortunately, those, I mean, those are big when it comes to scope and casualties and um, that kind of thing. At sea, at the Battle of Dogger Bank, the British Navy sinks one German cruiser, but the rest of the German squadron escapes. Command of the seas has allowed Britain to impose a naval blockade of Germany, preventing vital supplies, including food, from reaching the country by sea. Germany now retaliates with its own blockade. It declares the waters around the British Isles to be a war zone, where its U-boats will attack Allied merchant ships without warning. If you want to hear me talk more about the U-boats and stuff, make sure you saw the first video, because that's when they talk about it, how kind of the Germans use that technique to be able to have some kind of effectiveness over Britain. Now, again, uh, foreshadowing a little bit, basically declaring that the entire European coast here of Britain and mainland Europe is a war zone. Uh, is something other countries are going to have to take note of, especially like the United States, which declared neutrality but wants to do trade with these nations. And merchant ships are, you know, it's very risky to go into these places because um, you're in a war zone and you're going at your own risk. Britain relies on imported food to feed its population. Germany plans to starve her into surrender. The British Empire is here, they get stuff from everywhere. On the eastern Americas, front, German India, Field Holland. Marshal von Hindenburg launches a winter offensive and inflicts another massive defeat on the Russian army at the Second Battle of Masurian Lakes. The Russians lose up to 200,000 men, half of them surrendering amid freezing winter conditions. Wow. The Russians have more success against Austria-Hungary the city of Shemishul falls after a four-month siege, netting the Russians 100,000 prisoners. I've never heard, I'd, I'd never heard of um, wars that have so many people surrendering, or there's so many, yeah, surrender. I mean, obviously the populations are bigger, but like these, these, yeah, these cities and stuff of, or, or soldiers, where it's like 100,000, 200,000, multiple hundreds of thousands of people surrendering. It just shows how devastating this was that that many people, you know, you would, you would have to avoid, you know, fighting um, because how devastating this is. Austria-Hungary's total losses now reach 2 million. Gosh. Okay, March. March 1915. This war is less than a year old. Austria-Hungary, the big nation, but I mean, it's not the United States or Russia. 2 million. Meanwhile, Dead. the British and French send warships to the Dardanelles to threaten Constantinople, yep. capital of the Turkish Ottoman Empire. You know geographically how important this is. Constantinople has been, through much of human history, has been uh, maybe the most important city in the world because it connects trade going this way uh, along the Black Sea um, and then across the land. It's right between, you know, it's right where Europe and um Asia meet. It is where multiple versions and lines of the Silk Road come. Uh, it's such a big thing. Now for this war, again, it's so important. And why it was so important, again, for the central powers or uh, um, Austria-Hungary and Germany to have the Ottoman Empire here and to have them uh, as a part of this is they control the strait between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, which is the only way that the British or the French could be able to, you know, outflank them, uh, the central powers, or probably most importantly, hook up with the Russians. So having the Ottoman Empire be able to hold this, and of course the Ottoman Empire, they've been holding this strait of water since they took Constantinople in 1453. It's been uh, 400 years. They know how to defend this. They know how to do it and they've been doing it for centuries. They believe a show of force will quickly cause Turkey to surrender. They bombard Turkish shore forts in the narrow straits but three battleships are sunk by mines and three more Dang, damaged. The attack how's it even up off. How's it even, how's that thing even uh, staying afloat? It's amazing. Deadlock, okay. No movement on the on west. On the western front, the British attack at Neuve Chapelle. 
but the advance is soon halted by German barbed wire and machine guns. Barbed wire machine guns are two things that really made their big debut, I would say, amongst two power, especially the machine guns. Machine guns had kind of been used before. I mean, some of these imperial nations were using it when taking over colonies. But now you're talking about armies that both have them, which we'd never really seen before. And we started to see barbed wire, which, of course, had been used for um, cattle and stuff like that, farming. But now using it to defend your trench, which, again, made it even more unlikely that you could actually cross no man's land. Is Not only, of course, do you have machine gun fire and artillery at you, you've got to go through a maze of razor-sharp wire, which, again, makes this... Basically an immovable war out here on the west. British and Indian units suffer 11,000 casualties. Britain, about a yep, quarter recruited of the attacking force. Many Indians, maybe even more than the actual Six British weeks later, at the Second Battle of Ypres, the Germans attack with poison gas for the first time on the Western Front. Another introduction, if you're keeping your list, right, of maybe you could easily be making a list here of all the new stuff that comes out in the war that where you have multi, uh, powers using these machine guns, um, airplanes, which I'm sure they're going to get into. You get barbed wire. Um, now you're seeing, again, new stuff, things like gas, which, I mean, it's kind of new, but not on the scale before. You can have tanks later, but go ahead and get that. So the Germans first to use it, and I'm sure they'll talk about when. A they cloud of lethal chlorine forces side. allied troops to abandon their trenches but the Germans don't have enough reserves ready to exploit the advantage. Here is what, and I don't mean to interrupt as much as I am right now, but they're really important points I, I'm sure you'd be interested in. I consider like the warfare, especially on the Western Front, because there's a lot of new things happening. It's all about who can gain advantage whether the current situation is. Obviously, trench warfare isn't working offensively. Works defensively, does nothing offensively. You have a problem. You can't get your other enemy out of their trench to push them back. So how do you deal with that? You got to get them out of their trench. Enter then gas, right? You launch gas canisters, hopefully with accuracy, hopefully with favorable wind patterns. Get them to land in or near a trench, forcing those people to have to get out of their trenches where they either have to retreat or they get mowed down by machine gun fire. So then it becomes, okay, well, how do you defend yourself against, you know, gas, right? And so you're going to need gas masks, but it's all about that. How can you get the advantage? And that's what this war is. It's a back and forth of new technologies and new strategies, innovating, new, again, new, with, the, with the emphasis on new ones to try to get a turn in this battle. Because, again, it's we're now about a year and nothing's happening on the West. Other than Soldiers death. on both sides are quickly supplied with crude gas masks. Yeah, and they're bad. As a chemical weapons arms race begins. Worst way to die, they said. Slow, painful. The Allies land ground troops now they're dying almost any other way. Including men of the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps. It was the, the big Anzacs. epic fail of the British. Their goal is to take out the shore forts that are preventing Allied warships reaching Constantinople. But they immediately meet fierce Turkish resistance and are pinned down close to the shore. The day before the landings, the Ottoman Empire nearly ruins the systematic Winston Churchill's career and murder of he was instrumental Armenians in leading it, living within its borders. The Armenians are a long persecuted ethnic and religious minority. So I'm going to come back to this because I want to make sure you're paying attention. Armenian genocide uh, is completely overlooked when you look at other genocides. If it wasn't things like the Jewish Holocaust, uh, you know, or something like that, like you would. You, you, I think you would have heard about this more. Um, so I'm going to rewind at the 5, 10 seconds here because the Armenian genocide is something that has been very kind of swept under the rug about what happened to these people in the Ottoman Empire. Let's go back. 15 seconds. Before the landings, the Ottoman Empire begins the systematic deportation and murder of ethnic Armenians living within its borders. People they think that are not loyal and are going to aid the The Armenians are a long-persecuted ethnic and religious minority, suspected of supporting Turkey's enemies. Right. Thought they'd be Tens tra of traitors to the of Russians. Men, women and children are transported to the Syrian desert and left to die. In all, more than a million Armenians perish. The Allies condemn the events as a crime against humanity and civilization and promise to hold the perpetrators criminally responsible. To this day, the Turkish government disputes the death toll and that these events constituted a genocide. 
Yeah. They think of it as it's war. It's, you know, these people are disloyal to the empire. They are going to aid like the Russians and um, or I guess really any of their enemies. So they see it as, you know, some it's hard. To, it's hard to stereotype anything here. It's hard to group anything here. But um, yeah, many seeing it as as a justified act of war. Big push now. Finally, some movement. I mean, the East has always had more movement. But. On the Eastern Front, a joint German-Austro-Hungarian offensive in Galicia breaks through Russian defenses, recapturing Chemischul and taking 100,000 How do you pronounce that word? It is the beginning of a steady advance against Russian forces. At sea, the British passenger liner Lusitania Sailing from New York to Liverpool is a big one. Is torpedoed by a German U-boat off the coast of Ireland without warning. One thousand. Okay, without warning. I mean, no, not maybe not actually at that exact moment, but the Germans made it very, very clear to the Americans about don't come out here. Don't come out here. Can't guarantee your safety. There's talk about how Germany actually like published news about that, like in America. And and even the Lusitania itself, they were coming out and saying, don't get on the ship, right? Because it was this big deal. It's a sister ship, basically like the Titanic. This is an era of big, huge, industrial-sized uh, luxury liners. So this was going from New York um, to, to, to London. I don't know if it was London, but it was going to England. And it had about, what, 1,200 passengers. Uh, 200 of them about were American. And nearly everybody basically dies. Um, um, in this, it was sunk by U-boats. And this was one of the big, if there are specific moments for American history, was a big one that really, it was not an overnight thing. It's not a Pearl Harbor, right? It's not an overnight thing. All of a sudden, the whole country's behind it and Congress is behind it. Let's go to war. No, but it was something that really maybe pushed people on the fence, that were on the fence um, over to the, maybe we think about getting involved in this war kind of thing. And 198 passengers and crew perish, including 128 Americans. U.S. President Woodrow Wilson and the American public are outraged. But Germany insists the liner was a fair target, as the British used her to carry military supplies. That's something we found out later, by the way. We found more about that later, only a few years ago, when archaeologists actually went down to the wreckage, uh, which is just south of Ireland, of the Lusitania. We found that the um, Americans were smuggling war materials into Britain, which is something I believe the Americans had denied, and were saying, "Hey, okay, like we get it," because they have all kinds of um, scuffles, you know, with with getting stuff over there. Obviously, Germany doesn't want Americans to sit there and declare neutrality, but are still giving war materials to your enemy because that kind of makes you the enemy of Germany, right? And so the Americans were like, all right, we're not doing that anymore. But what they did is started smuggling stuff on passenger ships because then the idea was, well, it's passenger ships, so it's peaceful. And the Germans like, all right, whatever, but how do you know? And we come to find out long time later that indeed the Lusitania was being smuggled. You can go ahead and you can um, do searches on the internet and stuff, and you can see the photos of artillery and stuff like that that was that was on there, which uh, exposed a big lie that was happening um, for the Allies. In May, the Allies launched the Second Battle of Artois in another effort to break through Twa. the German lines. The French Can't flank make each other. an attack at Vimy Ridge, while the British launched supporting attacks at Aubert Ridge and Festubert. The Allies sustain 130,000 casualties and advance just a few thousand yards. You look at that, right? They talk about price of a mile. Right? How many casualties is it worth to advance a mile? Is it worth tens of thousands to go a few feet, right? That's why we've never seen stuff like this. That summer, is above the it? Western Front, the Fokker Eindecker helps Germany win control of the air. There's another new thing. It's one of the first aircraft with a machine gun able to fire forward through its propeller, thanks to a new invention known as interrupter gear. Allied aircraft losses mount rapidly in what becomes known as the Fokker Scourge. Yeah. Remember airplanes are also, this is a new thing introduced to war. Remember World War One, 
planes are not like you see in World War II. Um, originally, because remember, um, flight is within like 10 years of the the the, the uh, Wright brothers doing their little, you know, tiny little flights, right? It's it's a brand, literally a brand new technology. And planes weren't fast enough or heavy enough to be able to go very far distances. They could not carry uh, like bombs and stuff like that. So they were originally used mostly for uh, reconnaissance observations, which would make sense because you don't know necessarily what an enemy's trenches, uh, what they look like. So you map out the enemy trenches. Now, before we know it, of course, both sides are going to get planes, which means those planes are now going to have to be able to defend themselves. And that was very difficult to be able to get a mechanism safely that you could, you know, uh, um, use a machine gun. So you got the first dogfights and get famous guys like the Red Baron and stuff like that. But again, another new technology making its appearance that will, just like other technologies um, that are here in World War One, are just going to be expanded and made even more devastating in World War II. Italy, they've been waiting, waiting for a deal, waiting for an opportunity. Italy, swayed by British and French promises of territorial gains at Austria-Hungary's expense, yep. joins the Allies. They're waiting for a deal. Declaring war on Austria-Hungary and later the Ottoman Empire and Germany. They wanted something in for the themselves. The Italian army makes its first assault against Austro-Hungarian positions along the Isonzo River, but is repulsed with heavy losses. Bad news for Austria because they really didn't have to fight two fronts. Um, they were able to push into Serbia, they were able to push and fight the Russians. Now they got a western front. That's bad news for them. Meanwhile, the Allies face a crisis on the eastern front. The Russians have begun a general retreat, abandoning Poland. German troops enter Warsaw on the 5th of August. That's big. Tsar Nicholas II dismisses the Russian army's commander-in-chief, Grand Duke Nicholas, and takes personal command. It will prove disastrous for the Tsar, as he becomes more and more closely tied to Russian military defeat. At Gallipoli, having more success over the there. Allies land reinforcements at Suvla Bay, but neither they nor a series of fresh attacks by the Anzacs can break the deadlock. Conditions for both sides are terrible. Troops are tormented not only by the enemy, but by heat, flies, and sickness. In the Atlantic, a German U-boat sinks the liner SS Arabic. 44 are lost, including three Americans. In response to further US warnings, Germany ends all attacks on passenger ships. Do not want to get the Americans involved, right? But they're fearful that they would at some On point. On the Western Front, the Allies mount their biggest offensive of the war so far, designed to smash through the front and take pressure off their beleaguered Russian ally. The well, French attack in the Third Battle of Artois and Second Battle of Champagne. The British, with the help of poison gas, attack at Loss. So you see the, um, so the Germans introduce the gas and then the British start using it. So you usually saw that one, one group would um, bring in something new, the other ones usually very quickly would counter it. At initial gains, the attacks soon get bogged down with enormous losses on all sides. Crazy, huh? Allied troops land at Salonika in Greece to open a new front against the Central Powers and bring aid to Serbia. But the Allies are too late. Bulgaria joins the Central Powers. Uh -oh. More help in the middle joint offensive overruns Serbia in two months. Bad news for the Serbs. That winter, the remnants of the Serbian army escape through the Albanian mountains. Their losses are horrific. By the end of the war, a third of Serbia's army has been killed. Wow. The highest proportion of any nation. I didn't know that. Because they, they were doing quite well at the beginning. They were able to stop uh, Austria-Hungary, um, at least from getting all the way through, and put up a, a great fight and done pretty well. But, you know, obviously harder to fight against too, especially when you're flanked, which is what happened there. Fierce fighting continues on the Italian front, 
as Italian troops launched the third and fourth battles of the Isonzo. Austro-Hungarian forces, though outnumbered, are dug in on the high ground and impossible to dislodge. So you got like almost like this trench stuff, but the problem is, yeah, it's this area is so mountainous. Whoever gets the high ground wins, where it's very flat out west um, in northern France. Right? This is very different. Way, way easier to fortify, man, even harder to cross in. In the Middle East, a British advance on Baghdad is blocked by Turkish forces at the Battle of Tessifon, 25 miles south of the city. Tessifon. The British withdraw to Kut, where they are besieged. The Allies abandon the Gallipoli campaign. 83,000 troops are secretly evacuated without alerting Turkish forces. Not a man is lost. It's one of the best executed plans of the war. <laughs> Leaving. The campaign has cost both sides a quarter of a million casualties. 1915 is a bad year for the Allies. Enormous losses for no tangible gains. Mm. But there is no talk of peace. Instead, all sides prepare for even bigger offensives in 1916, with new tactics developed from earlier failures. All sides I'm still believe learn. a decisive battlefield victory is within grasp. Epic History TV relies on the support of viewers like you. So there's the first one. Please visit want a our Patreon page and consider pledging Just as little Russia as $1 per general. video to help us keep making them. Pirates? The guy got a great narrating voice. What's his name? Charles Nove. Okay, cool. All right, another awesome video. I'm learning tons, I'm learning tons. That's somebody who already, I really like studying the war. Um, I'm really, really, really enjoying this. So we still got, we got 1916, 17. I don't know if they would do an 18, cause uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, well, yeah, they're gonna wanna do an 18 to get the end of the war. I meant uh, 19 if they talk about the peace or whatever. So long way to go. And it looks like, you know, at the end around Christmas time, you know, people were thinking in that first year, 1914, this war, you know, over by Christmas kind of thing. And still thinking the war was very close, but now at the night, end of 1915, you could see they've swallowed that and are now saying, no, this this is going to last much longer. Um, I think they've understood this is now the most violent and highest casualty, most destructive war in history. And they're going to have to innovate, which we're seeing that. And it becomes this war of technological competition. Who can bring something that the others are not ready for? So, but we all know too, 1916 is not the end of this. This is going to keep going for a few more years. So I'm still interested. If you guys still want to see this series and see me um, kind of chunk away at this series year by year, let me know. Or if you want to move on, so be it. But um, yeah, let me know what you, uh, what you think of this series. I'm loving, again, learning a lot. I think it's great. Well narrated. Great details without being overbearing. Um, kind of said that at the end of the, the, the first episode, but definitely loving this thing. Okay, awesome. All right, please uh, make sure if you have not, uh, even if you're sub to them, make sure you give them the views and stuff like that for their awesome things uh, over there. Hopefully I was able to add a little bit of my perspective um, on things. These are all, I'm, I'm learning so much things. I'm trying to digest into something very streamlined for teaching in a public education sense and not just for me to develop just some personal knowledge of it i try to you know frame these things in a way that you can teach it make it interesting and um, always try to teach cause and effect that kind of thing all right anyways i think we're good um again links down below original video discord teespring if you want to get some history related merch that stuff is still up there patreon if you want to vote on videos that get on here also if you're a gamer check out my gaming channel i am uh, streaming games over there and also doing videos on there uh, as well. So a lot of stuff, hopefully you to keep you guys entertained and interested in history. But thank you just for being here, being a part of the history community out here on YouTube. And we'll see you next time. Bye.